world's strongest pro bodybuilder. Ten weeks out, take you through and show you what I do for the workouts, get prepped for the competition. Come on. Bench day today. I can do a little chest workout. Today will be a heavy day, but it won't be my flat press day. I'll train uh, flat press about every third workout. If you want a big bench, don't bench every exercise every time you train. You got to bench big, and then you have to work your ancillary body parts doing. Uh, inclines, dips, uh, you know, work your supporting muscle groups. And then you also have to have speed day. So big bench is going to require some explosive speed training as well. So today we're going to do ancillary exercises. We'll still do some heavy weights, but we won't be doing doubles. We'll try and work up to fives to tens. Uh, and we'll do a variety of different exercises to complement the flat bench press. That's what we're going to work on today. Everybody always asks me, you know, how do I lift these weights at my age and this much weight and not get injured? And, um, you know, it's a, it's a whole process. Um, you know, it's really important that you warm up well. And that, uh, that just includes putting the sweat on. I don't stretch aggressively right before I train because that can actually weaken your muscles and tendons. You stretch on a different workout so you can recover from that. So I'll go through just enough range of motion to be able to do the exercises I'm trying to do. I'll warm up and make sure I got a sweat on. I'll always use neoprene on my elbows uh, and try and stay real warm. Depending on the temperature outside, I might wear a sweater uh, or a hat or something just to stay warm and then I get started real slow and real gradual and uh, uh, work my way up gradually in the weights to make sure I can handle all that weight. It's going to go a little slow at first here because uh, we're going to you know, work up to quite a bit of weight. I want to make sure that uh, we don't stretch or pull anything. Uh, the only way I'm going to lift big at the Olympia is if I get there healthy. So. so I'll always train with these these neoprenes on my elbows, cold taffy breaks, warm taffy bends, so you got to keep those, uh, those tendons pliable, keep them warm. I know sometimes as you see me do my big lifts on YouTube or obviously in competition, you know, you got to take these off, but uh, always when I'm training, I'm wearing these as much as I can. This is just a neoprene, so it doesn't, uh, what I call, crutch the, the joint. Uh, sometimes folks will wear something a little heavier, which I do as well, but I won't wear them all the time because anytime you wear something really supportive gear like this, you can actually weaken a joint or weaken a muscle group. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, wearing a cast on your ankle or something, the muscle will atrophy and you'll actually get weaker. So I'd be cautious. I only use these as I get up to really heavy weights. Same with the wrist straps. I only use them when I get up to really heavy weights. Uh, when the muscle strength exceeds, you know, the tendons and, and uh, the uh, flexors ability to, to do the work. So we'll get warmed up real well, we'll just start with the bar, do a modest stretch. I don't do anything aggressive here, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to thin that muscle out and make it weak. I'm just trying to make sure I can go through the range of motion. Leo, come on over, let's roll this. My training partner, Leo Wells, six years now, I think we've been doing this together. What are you pushing, 50? Strongest guy I know. You pushing 50 now, Leo? Um, 49. Kind of, you know, body boy. Right? <laughs> so we're both a couple old guys. So <laughs> yeah. We're hanging in there and we're healthy because, uh, you know, we train smart and we take care of our bodies and uh, uh, show you how we can lift some big weights and not, not get injured. It just requires that you pay attention all the time. It's a, it's a gradual process, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So, uh, knock on wood, I've never had any significant injuries. Occasional tendonitis when I try and push too hard, I've got to be cautious and uh, make sure I, I work up gradually. When you're getting ready for a big lift or if you want to max out, all the big time power lifters will pyramid into that kind of, uh, of a meet. Meaning that they'll, they, won't, they won't try and bench their max every single week, you know, pushing it up five pounds if they can here or there. They'll deload, they'll start, you know, if I'm gonna go bench a 600, I might start 10 weeks out benching, uh, only going up to 500 for sets of three to five. Uh, and, and, you know, slowly week over week, add 10 to 15 pounds, uh, and gradually reduce the reps to twos. And I might not even do a, a single until I get to the meet. That might be the first single I do. But it, it's, you know, it's called pyramiding, or periodization, as uh, a lot of folks in the industry like to call it. And we just try and, try and gradually work ourselves up into a max. Otherwise, what happens is you overload your body and you're gonna start dropping off. Almost everybody knows that you know, when you try and max every week on the bench, it starts to dip, it starts to get weaker. 
and you get frustrated. <clears throat> Whether I'm doing the bar or 135 or two and a quarter or just working my way up, every rep, every set is the same. Uh, the bench press is initiated through the feet. It's, a, it's an explosive movement that works through the whole body. If you just try and stand and push right here, you're not going to be very strong. But if you get your hips down and get your feet back, and now try and push, you'll be real strong. It's the same on the bench press. You want to get your back arched, get your hips down, get your legs into the movement. You're actually starting the push for the bench press. It starts from the feet. It pushes all the way up through the hips and then explodes through the chest. So as weights go up, I'll talk to you about uh, setting your body up like a spring to, to actually coil up and explode. So what I'll do is I'll get into position, get the back arched, get the shoulder blades pinched together and down. I'll grab the bar and I'll, actually, I'll initiate just a little bit of tension on the bar. I don't want somebody to lift out for me and then try and uh, establish a base because it's too late. You're, you, you already lost your arch, you already lost your, your spring load. So when somebody lifts out, you should already have tension on the bar. Shoulder blades should be uh, closer to your hips than, than if you were flat. <clears throat> and uh, together and arched so that when you take that weight, you're already, you're, the spring's already loaded. And as you, as you resist the weight on the way down, it's like a spring and you should be able, it should, it should come down to the base and just pop right up through the feet. Another thing that's important is that you resist on the, on the, on the way down with your lats. So you, you turn your elbows in just a little bit and as the bar comes down, your lats are actually resisting by pressing against your tricep. You try that one time. If your arms are out here, there's nothing to resist. So when you get up to your heaviest weights, it's just gonna come down like that and, and cause you to have to do twice as much work. Resistance with the chest on the way down, press with the chest on the way up. What I'm doing here is I'm resisting with the back on the way down. I haven't even begun to activate my chest yet on the, on the down movement. I'm resisting with the back. And then I explode. This is for a max effort, uh, max bench press. We're not talking about what we do pre-contest to stimulate the most muscle tissue for bodybuilding. Uh, this is about power training, about getting as strong uh, and lifting as much weight as you can. And that's the technique we're going to be focusing on between now and the Olympia. bag of tricks. You know, this is a, I refer to them as gimmicks. <laughs> and as I slowly work up and wait, I add a new gimmick about every set. <laughs> Throw some chalk on. As we get heavier, we'll add a belt. We'll add some wrist straps. And we'll just keep uh, working our way up. Now on the base, you're getting your feet underneath you. We're not out here they're not you know, wobbly They're underneath you because I'm going to be driving through the feet, through the hips. It'll be a drive, I'll push off. But instead of my body going up, the weight will go up. <clears throat> now I'm going to drop. Some people push off the bar to try and get my shoulder blades down close to my hips. Get a good arch. And then I'm pinching my shoulder blades together on the bench then I'll put tension on the bar. That locks me into position. If I let go of the tension on the bar, look what happens if my chest caves in. My chest caves in, then my back flattens out against the bench. I'm losing that spring-loaded quality that allows me to push through my feet. Because if my chest is caved in and my back's against the bench, I'm not gonna be able to, to explode through the feet. So I stay locked in here, pick off, Nice and still nice and tight. If you're trying to do a max lift, uh, it's important not to get a pump in the muscle. It sounds contrary to bodybuilding, but this is about power training. The muscle fibers, they slide across each other like this as they expand and contract. Now if you get those full of blood, they start swelling 
they're, it's harder to slide those fibers across each other. It makes it harder to lift your max weight. So we're not shooting for a pump. So when I'm warming up, all I'm trying to do is, is make sure my muscles can feel the load gradually until I get to my max. But I'm not trying to put a pump in there. I won't do 10 reps. I'll do threes, twos, just to gradually make sure I'm uh, allowing my body to, to, to compensate slowly to the load so I don't pull or tear anything. Another way to do that is good rest period. Let that uh, lactic acid dissipate, uh, let the, the muscle completely recover, get all your oxygen back, and uh, that might take three minutes between sets. As you get heavier, it might take longer. You might spend five, six minutes between a set to be able to get 100% of your strength back so you can make the big lift. There's a mental aspect to this too. The lighter the weight feels, the stronger you're gonna be. Sometimes I'll do 135 again, or I'll do two and a quarter again. It's the first time you do it, you're kind of feeling it, the body's stretching out. Um, you know, you're just kind of getting used to the, to the range of motion, finding your groove. Second time you do it, the thing just explodes out of your hands. That's the mental part that, that allows you just to keep progressing. And as long as you don't have a, a limit mentally, <laughs> Shouldn't have a limit physically. See, I explode those reps with a lot of speed. And I also have a speed day where I train just for that. And the reason being is, is that when we get up to a 500 or 600 pound press, you're not gonna be able to tricep lock that thing out. You need to build as much momentum as possible. The faster that thing comes off the chest, the more momentum you can build, then you can decelerate on the lockout, which is gonna happen anyhow, because there's so much weight you're going to want to always develop a lot of speed and power lifting out of every lift. It be the squat, deadlift, or the bench. You've got to come out of the hole hard and strong because finishing that lift is going to be easier if you explode out of the base. Now, I know you really shouldn't need a pickoff on two and a quarter, but uh, like I said, when I'm training, I try and do every set the same. And I'm gonna have my body all coiled. I don't wanna, <clears throat> when I pick off, I wanna be already in position. I don't wanna be up here trying to pick the weight off and then try and wedge myself into position. Set my feet, <clears throat> my shoulder blades together, grab the weight, applying a little bit of tension. The weight's coming off just a little bit, applying a little tension. I keep that tension on so that my shoulder blades stay in position. Leo will bring that out to me. Go. And now my body never moved. So when I start to coil up, the spring explode right through the feet. Didn't have to reset anything. This little gimmick right here. When I was training at a super training gym down in uh, Sacramento with Mark Bell, uh, big time powerlifting coach and powerlifter himself, uh, I had just come off competing in the uh, Masters Nationals and I was down to probably 255 after all the photo shoots and whatever. And I was all dried out and, and uh, really low body fat and lean and I went in there and immediately I started trying to lift heavy. And the first thing that happened is when I got in and started lifting heavy is I started getting tendonitis and I had you know, forearm flexor tendonitis, I had elbow tendonitis, I had bicep tendon tendonitis. Uh, you know, I was going to the chiropractor and I was doing icing and getting uh, deep tissue massage and, and uh, uh, you know, electric stem. It was a tough time. I thought I was going to have to drop out. Well, Mark Bell comes up with this deal. And uh, what this is, is I showed you those thick elbow wraps that are made out of knee wrap material, just like these, but they're made out of out of a really sturdy, strong knee wrap material. Well, that's what this is right here. And so, you pull this up over your elbow, and this is an extremely tough material. When it bends, it, it gives you a lot of help. Well, then he connected the two with the same kind of material right here. So now, not only am I getting less tendon strain when I'm bringing the weight down to its uh, uh, a fully stretched position, but also across the chest, you'll notice when Leo was lifting, I'm getting less impact on the, the, the pec and the shoulder. Most of the injuries occur in the bottom position. That's when you're most stretched, when your body's the most compressed, 
your shoulders and chest are, are, are completely stretched out and are under the max load. Plus the fact that force is mass times acceleration, and a lot of people will bring that weight down quickly. So the force at the bottom is, is multiplied by the speed at which you descend the weight. So if you're bringing that down fast, you can imagine at full stretch, at full momentum from that weight, there's, that's where the injuries are going to occur. And you're going to start getting problems with your shoulder and your pec and your elbow tendons on that compression at the very bottom. This eliminated that. It decelerated the weight. It makes the weight lighter at the bottom than it is at the top. At the top, you got full weight. Down here, it might be 50 pounds lighter as a result of this thing absorbing the weight. Kind of like wearing a bench shirt, but it's something you can put in your bag. This is a, an old prototype model that he made for me last year. It was the first one he made. And he made it for me to help me get through that, that uh, rigorous training regimen. And it worked. My tendonitis eased up. I was able to still train heavy. Um, but it's an effective tool. And uh, I use it. And I brought one in for Leo to use because he was having some shoulder problems. And uh, now he can still bench heavy and not have those shoulder pains or the tendonitis in the elbows. Because where all that strain occurs is now being assisted by that material. Every set the same. Make 405 look like 135. Every set the same. The goal here is to get warmed up nice and gradual so you're not putting the undue pressure on the tendons and the joints. And the muscles get used to the load so that when we get heavy they, they aren't surprised by it. And that's how we avoid injury. Sometimes I gotta switch gears if, uh, if I feel any, you know, any twinges or any pain and uh, move to a different exercise or just not go heavy that day. I got a constant release in my body. Can't train hurt and you can't compete hurt. So we're just constantly pushing ourselves right up against the limit while staying healthy so we can do we can get to the meat, you know, hundred percent and we do the best we can. It's, uh, one dumb day and one injury you know can blow the whole blow the whole event for you. gimmick. Tying the shoe is another gimmick. The drive comes from the feet. So on this set we want to have everything in play. We want to have the from head to toe. We want to have our wraps tight, our chalk heavy, our belt tight. <clears throat> Everything's in play. Leo, we gotta put a little two and a half on there, 495 <laughs> 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 I, didn't, I didn't know what these were for the longest time. I thought they were like coasters for your cups. But I didn't know anybody had to use these things. It just sounds better to say 500.
groove is on that one. See that third rep went way out of the groove. Came out, came out in front of me instead of up and back. Come on out. We'll do some incline dumbbell press. I know a lot of folks who finish bench press and come to do incline and start running the rack. I do the 80s for 10, the 90s for 10, the 100s for 10. I'm going to work up to one set here. <clears throat> That's what I call max effort sets or growth sets. I think uh, my old school upbringing back in the mid 80s was, uh, was always uh, you know, trying to get the most out of my sets. <clears throat> See that 500 still kind of winded me. So I go from a flat press to an incline press, <coughs> or an incline bar today to an incline dumbbell. And again, I use this because it requires so much uh, balance and coordination that you know it helps you stay in your groove. You notice on the third rep of that 500 incline, I wasn't in my groove. I came out here, and it took a lot to pull that back in. It's a long, struggling rep. This kind of exercise helps you stay in your groove. It works on all those surrounding muscle groups that pull and push against each other to keep you balanced. So <clears throat> I like the free weights, I like the balancing exercises. But I don't run the rack again. I don't come off of a bench for an incline press and go to 80s and then the 100s and the 120s and the 140s. It's a waste of time. I mean, if I do 80s for 10 and I could have done it for 30, what benefit am I gonna get out of that? So I like to grab weights that I, I actually get some results from, what I call growth sets or max effort sets. <clears throat> and do something that'll, that'll actually overload my system. If you wanna get results, you gotta overload your body and you can't do it by doing endless reps and sets of uh, weights that, that, don't, uh, that don't cause your body to overload and adapt. So I'll jump on a 140 for six or so reps just to feel the weight one time because I'm, I'm going real heavy here. I'll go up to two, 200s. And I gotta be able to, to gauge this. <laughs> Most clubs, that's about all you get. You might only go up to 120s or 140s if you're lucky. And in which case you might have to pre exhaust or your partner might have to push down on them or you might have to do flies if you, if you, you pass there. I bought these and brought them in because I wanted to challenge myself. Always a challenge. Like I said earlier, you got to be in it mentally because uh, if you don't have it mentally, you're not going to have it physically. Hardest part about these is just kicking them up, getting them into position. I only show the videos where I actually succeed at that, but I think currently it's about a 50% failure rate. Just trying to kick them up sometimes they get out of whack and fall and so today we'll show whatever happens happens we'll see if i can get it on the first try if not you just try again if something doesn't rip off your body that's all you can do these are 210 pounds we got 20 20 10 pound plates 10 on each side a 10 pound bar.
down over there. I'm trying to concentrate. <laughs> Whew. Yeah, I got out of got out of whack here a little bit. <sighs> Thanks, Leo. <sighs> That's fun shit right there. <laughs> That's fun stuff. <clears throat> I told you. If an arm didn't tear off, that'd be pretty cool to watch. Of course, it'd be pretty cool to watch the arm tearing off, too. <laughs> <sighs> Close grip. Okay. Bench press. That's a max effort set. That's what I'm talking about. If you do it like that, there's no way you're running the rack. You can't do it anymore. That's the way that Mike Menser used to, used to do it. That's the way Dorian Yates did it. You get results from a set like that. Now I talked about doing max effort sets and growth sets. What's heavy to you is what works. Don't worry because you're not inclined pressing the 200 pound dumbbells, you're not going to grow. If 100 is that hard to you, you're going to grow from 100. It's about overloading your body and what your capabilities are and continually pushing that envelope, pushing those limits. Get in here and break down the muscle tissue get out, eat and recover. I don't like to spend more than an hour in the gym. I'm running a little long today, because it took me so long to warm up. But uh, this will probably be our last exercise, because I want you guys to see what I actually do. I don't want to try and, you know, dress it all up for the camera. But uh, normally I'd be walking out of here right about now, except I took a 40 minute warm up on that bench press, so. I'm gonna throw in a couple of tricep exercises here. And just one, just a close grip press. I got plenty of work on that incline bench and on that dumbbell press. My muscles will be sore, broken down, get stronger over the next few days. So we'll finish off these triceps, make sure they're challenged as well. Same thing on tries, growth set. I'm just gonna feel a couple reps, make sure that the tendons are comfortable with the movement. And I'm gonna do one or two sets as heavy as I can go, as hard as I can go with the spot, and I'll be done. I'll show you a little trick on these. A lot of times, you do close grip press, you get some little twinge in the elbow, you get some tendonitis, it feels shitty at the bottom. And the reason for that is when you grab the bar traditionally, look at where my elbows are pointing. They're pointing out here. If you want to drop those elbows in so that when you come down they're close to the body, you've got to change your grip as well. So don't try and grab the bar here and then just force your elbows in. That's going to cause that tendonitis problem. Rotate your grip slightly. Instead of the bar laying straight across your calluses, <clears throat> I'll rotate my hand slightly so that the bar rests here on the pad of the hand. I'll show you when I set up for the next set. We'll get a closer grip, a closer look at the camera. Rotate my hand slightly, rotates my elbow in. Now when I come down, the elbow's in line, no more tendonitis. One challenge with that rotated grip is that your spotter really needs to do all of the lift off. Because you're pretty strong here, 
See as you rotate that grip, it almost feels more like a, a French press coming off of here. There's no way you can French press 315 or 405 off the rack. So your partner has to bring that weight out to you, so it's sitting out here for the pressing movement. So here's your traditional grip right here, just right across the calluses. All I'm trying to do is rotate my hand just a little bit so that my elbow, see how my elbow comes in now, from here to here. And the bar sits on the pad of my hand. <clears throat> Now I'm already in it. My elbows are already in a close grip position. All right, Leo. One, two, up. My triceps pretty good. I think that's about it for me. Remember I said I like to get in and out of the gym in an hour. If you take one thing from this video, the thing I want you to take is that you don't grow in the gym. All you do in here is break down muscle tissue. You do not build muscle in the gym. You can't lift more, more often, longer, and expect to get results. Your goal in here is to break down the muscle tissue as quickly as possible because you grow during the recovery phase, eating and sleeping. I'll talk a lot about that in this video because that's where all of my results come from. It's an extraordinary discipline to the recovery phase. Take that from this, if nothing else. Anybody who has problems growing is invariably training too much and eating and sleeping too little. You swap those around, train less, eat more, you're going to grow and get stronger every day. I know this is a power training video. I'm talking about training for what is essentially a power meet, power lifting meet at the Mr. Olympia. But it is dubbed the world's strongest pro bodybuilder. And I know that's part of what my opponents like to squawk about, is that I'll come rolling in there at 300 pounds, all fat and happy, and uh, outlift them while they're supposed to stay lean and mean. So even at 290 plus, I'm not getting sloppy. My diet's still in check, and I'm staying in shape. So it's not all just about powerlifting. I'm gorging myself and getting all hideous. <clears throat> That's it. <laughs> it's no Phil Heath, but I'm not going to get out of shape. I'm going to go in there strong and fit and represent the world's strongest pro bodybuilder with respect. I have a top sirloin steak. Is that a second or a nine ounce? Uh, nine ounce house sirloin, no butter, baked potato with that. And then, uh, you know, a little chicken breast with that too. So, a full chicken breast or a half? Full chicken breast with that. Yeah. How do you want your steak cooked? Medium. Do you want any soup or salad? No. So we just wrapped up the power training chest workout. I told you guys that uh, you know, the most important thing you can take from that workout is, is the the recovery phase. And I talked about how important it is that, uh, that you get your nutrition in immediately following the workout. So we went straight for the gym. We're over here at Applebee's now, getting some food. There's an important window of opportunity. I know you've heard it a thousand times and then repeat it again. There's an important window of opportunity immediately following a workout. The next 30 minutes to 60 minutes following a workout. When you really want to get yourself fed, start replenishing your body. It's hungering for uh, all the nutrients that it lost during that workout. It'll absorb a lot more protein, it'll absorb a lot more carbs than it would at any other time during the day. 
So if you don't bring your food to the gym, you want to immediately eat following the workout. I used to bring, and still do sometimes, bring shakes to the gym, but I like to get solid food in now, uh, particularly because I'm trying to gain weight and gain strength. And those shakes that just burn right through you. So what we're going to try and do is, is feed ourselves as quickly as possible following the workout. And uh, you want to get in, I think you want to get in at least 60, 70 plus grams of protein, 100 grams of carbs, uh, get a modest amount of fats in. I think it should be 800 plus calories. One of the things a lot of people do is they'll have a little shake or they'll have a you know, can of tuna or a little chicken breast or maybe a rice cake. It's not enough food. You can't grow on that. You can't get big and strong on that. So what I encourage you to do is uh, uh, you know, eat, eat a lot more calories immediately following the workout than what you've historically done in the past. Uh, you know, a scoop of protein powder probably only has 100, 120 calories in it. It's just not enough to, to feed you all. So, you know, even two scoops of protein, even if it's a weight gainer, you might only have 300, 350 calories. It's not enough. Maybe if you put that with two or three cups of milk and you throw in some carbohydrate, you know, with that, You'd be able to get you know, part of the meal, at least, at least enough food to start feeding yourself on. One of the biggest things that, uh, that I encourage people to do when they're trying to gain size and strength is to understand how important the diet is. Food is your God. And if you don't eat enough food, and you're, often enough, you're not going to grow. It's just not going to happen. The training part's the fun part. It's the easy part. Eating is where the results come from, and it's the hard part. Having enough discipline to eat enough food, often enough, consistently enough, and choosing the right foods, that's where all the challenge is. It's never perfect, but I'm going to give you some general guidelines to help you understand what it is you should be shooting for. And I think that some of the things you should be considering is getting in at least six meals a day. I eat every three hours. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and have a meal as well because I don't, I don't want to give my body an opportunity to lose, uh, to lose mass or my muscles uh, to start catabolizing and uh, lose muscle tissue. So I'll get in at least six meals a day, probably every three hours from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. And those meals consist of a good quality protein source, good fats, and a good complex carbohydrate. Don't be afraid of fats. You cannot grow without a, a decent amount of fats. It won't happen. Muscle is made up of protein and fat. Now, I'm not talking about intramuscular fat, I'm talking about the muscle cell itself is protein and globules of fat, the muscle cell itself. So you need to feed it fats. Not big loads of saturated fats, but quality fats, polyunsaturated fats. I shoot for about a, what I call a 30-30-30. About a third fats, third proteins, third carbs. And I try and get some of my fats from good sources such as uh, olive oils or macadamia nut oils, uh, you know, peanuts, peanut oils. Um, kind of what I'll do is I'll choose my protein sources to be have a modest amount of fat in them. I stay away from cheese, I stay away from mayonnaise, I stay away from butter, I stay away from some pork products like bacon, sausage, because most of those can be 70, 80, 90% fat. But I do eat lean steaks. I'll stick with like a top sirloin as opposed to uh, uh, maybe a flat iron or New York steak, which would be upwards of 60-70% fat. A top sirloin steak would get down to 40-30% fat or less. I'll stick with a 90 plus percent lean beef or a 93 or a 96 even, depending on whether I'm pre-contest or off-season. I can't get specific enough to answer the questions from every type of individual that might watch this uh, video. There's powerlifters, there's bodybuilders, there's people in the off-season, there's people dieting for shows, but I'm going to give you some guidelines that I think apply to everybody, and then from there, you can make some choices to, to, to meet your specific needs. And you're going to have to eat enough food. That's the big challenge. The quantities have to be large enough so that you can, you can grow muscle, you can, you can build muscle. Somewhere along the line, I don't know where it happened, so I guess uh, somebody went into a, a gym and saw some quote-unquote bodybuilder eating tuna fish and rice cakes and thought that was a bodybuilder's diet. So every time you hear about somebody going on a bodybuilding diet, they start eating chicken or white fish or some rice cakes or a little bit of oatmeal. And they can't figure out why they can't grow. It's not enough food. You know, four ounces of, of chicken is, is like 100 calories. You cannot grow on 
on that little food. I have to eat uh, over 6,000 calories a day just to maintain my weight. If I want to grow, I need to get up to 7,000, 7,500. So depending on what, how, what you weigh and what your goals are, you're going to have to, to start taking in more total calories. The more strict and the more specific uh, diet you try and put yourself on, I think the less opportunity you have to succeed. If somebody tells you you have to eat four ounces of this and two hours later you have to eat six ounces of that and you can have two servings of this, you're never going to stick with it. There's no way. But you can follow general guidelines within a normal lifestyle and consistently get enough meals, enough of the right quantities of food to continue to grow. And I can eat at any restaurant and choose sirloin steaks, uh, rice, potatoes, vegetables, uh, chicken, uh, salmon, I have to eat enough of it in order to get to all the calories I need, but I can choose those foods just about anywhere I go. It's a lot more important to get something in, even if it's imperfect, if it's not you know, ideal or exact, than to get nothing in. I think that there's a lesser of two evils that it is that you eat something that isn't perfect as opposed to not eating at all. Because if you skip a meal, you're going to start metabolizing muscle tissue and you're not going to grow. It's not going to happen. And, uh, you just choose to eat the food without the butter. You can choose a leaner cut of steak or you can choose a potato and, uh, you know, without the sour cream and butter to, you know, to make up your meal. If you can't cook every meal and take it with you and eat perfectly all day long, you still don't want to skip meals. If I have to, I'll stop at a fast food place and I'll just choose you know, to get my food without cheese or without mayonnaise and, and uh, you know, maybe a chicken sandwich, but I'll have to eat a few of them to get enough calories, just as so long as I'm not missing meals. And I think if you follow those simple guidelines that you'll be able to consistently grow and uh, you know, make the best of your recovery phase. Now, I tell you this from experience. I, I'm, you know, I'm the guy that was 145 pounds when I graduated from high school. I was lifting weights for almost three years and competed in my first bodybuilding show in 1988. I was 21 years old and I weighed 160 pounds. So I was not a big guy. When I first started lifting weights, I couldn't even bench 135. Nobody ever would have suspected that I would be 290 and benching 600. And I made all the mistakes. I made all the mistakes that I see everybody else making as they're coming up in bodybuilding or powerlifting or, or trying to gain size or strength. I train too much, I eat too little, I used to work out seven days a week, two hours a day, sometimes I do them twice a day. And I would never eat enough or I would be eating too lean of food, I wouldn't be getting enough fats in my diet or enough total calories in my diet. And I wouldn't be eating often enough. And I was having a hard time growing after three years of training only to be 160. Uh, you know, and two years later, uh, in 93, I won the Mr. Oregon, I was only 200 pounds. So I had made some significant gains, but winning a state championship with only 200 pounds at six foot, that's not a big guy. Uh, three years later, I competed in Mr. USA, I was only 217. So I've always been a slow gainer. I have this really fast metabolism, and I have had to learn to, to eat accordingly to my body type. Uh, which meant to eat a lot of food and to make sure I got in a significant amount of, of uh, you know, good fats. I also had to learn to train less, stimulate the muscle tissue breakdown, uh, you know, and eat more and more to, to try and grow and get strong. I didn't compete in the powerlifting meet until I had been training for over 10 years. I think it was 1996 finally. The first bodybuilding show was in 88. I did a powerlifting meet in 96 and another one in 97. And then as the story goes, I took 10 years off of bodybuilding. It took 12 years off of powerlifting. And uh, you know, I just worked and ran my business before I made a comeback. So I'm not somebody who has 20 years of powerlifting under their belt. I'm not somebody who's, who was 200 pounds in high school. That wasn't me. I'm the hard gainer, the slow gainer, the guy who was, who was weak in high school and had to slowly and gradually over you know, many years and learning many lessons 
get to where I was uh, through an extraordinary discipline towards the recovery phase. And I didn't go hang out, I didn't party, I didn't drink, I, I slept well every night, I ate every meal. Uh, I had to have an extraordinary discipline to make sure that, that I could catch up to or, or compete with guys who, who may have been uh, more fortunate genetically than me to, to, to have more muscle or to, to be a faster player. And it all came down to these fundamentals, these basic principles. Uh, is to stimulate the muscle tissue breakdown uh, with uh, max effort growth sets, in and out of the gym, uh, getting the, the best results you can from your workout, and then getting the nutrition that you need to start to grow. Six meals a day, high quantities of quality food, consistently, day over day, week over week, month after month. Uh, I see a lot of people that come in and out of the gym and they'll take time off and they, you get these, you know, these oscillating results. You have to consistently build on these foundations over time. And I took you know, what was 145 pound body in, coming out of high school, 160 pounds on stage in 1988 to 260 pounds on stage in the uh, 2009 Masters Nationals. Uh, and, and that, you know, is just a testimony to what can be done. I don't believe there are limitations. Everybody thinks there's some, you know, magic trick or somebody's more genetically inclined than others. I'm the least genetically inclined guy out there. I'm just the blue collar guy that put the work in. I was your 98 pound weekly. I wrestled 98 as a freshman, sophomore, and junior in high school. And I didn't even have to diet. I was 98 pounds a junior in high school. So I'm your uh, I'm your, your quintessential 98 pound weekly who through lots of discipline, lots of good nutrition, uh, you know, and, and basic fundamental principles, was able to slowly over many years, it's a marathon, not a sprint, gain a significant amount of, of muscle and you know bring me to where I am today.